And perhaps brain size alone isn't the only measure of intelligence. Although the hobbit's brain is smaller than a chimpanzee's, Falk notices dramatic differences. Over the entire surface, there were special features that you don't see in chimpanzees. Uh, and that was a surprise in and of itself. There are these two convolutions right in the front of the frontal lobe that are huge. And we see small traces of those convolutions at times in chimpanzees, but they're very small. These protruding frontal lobes expand a part of the brain believed vital for higher thinking and planning ahead. It made my team think that maybe we had hit upon part of the answer of how could such a little a, a creature with such a small brain have done the activities that the archaeologists had attributed to it. Activities such as hunting the elephants whose bones now litter the Liangbua site. True, these were pygmy elephants, smaller than some cows. But even so, quite a challenge for beings the size of three-year-olds. The brain suddenly pulled it all together into one beautiful coherent whole. This was a person who could hunt effectively, could obviously cross water barriers, could communicate perfectly effectively. To hunt a small elephant, they're still weighing half a ton. You're not going to tackle one of those by yourself. And all of these are indications of higher cognitive activity. So we think it was a new species and a really interesting one. But Falk acknowledges that some scientists are leery of inferring an entire species from one vanished brain. We need more fossils, and then, of course, DNA evidence. But that can be hard to come by if weather conditions aren't conducive and tropical kinds of habitats don't make for good preservation of DNA, but they're hunting, and I hope they find it. DNA would settle whether the hobbit was a diseased modern human or a new species. But so far, no DNA has been recovered. For anthropologist Shara Bailey, however, teeth might be enough to nail the hobbit's identity. I thought it would be a very simple task. I thought it was just a matter of taking a look and I'd be able to tell without a doubt. And, uh, and it became very complicated. Shara had two sets of teeth to compare. Those in the skull of the main skeleton called LB1 and the complete lower jaw of another hobbit who lived thousands of years earlier. She focused on the premolars, teeth used for grasping. Originally, when I saw LB1, I thought, well, this is just pathological. And then when they showed me the second one and it had the exact same premolar, I was really perplexed. The premolars were strikingly similar, which meant either that two individuals living thousands of years apart suffered from the same disease, or their teeth were normal for their species. It just doesn't make any sense. Shara asked biologist Tim Bromage for help. The structure of bones and teeth tell a huge amount about the life history of an organism. And they can also settle disagreements about whether the tissue is normal or comes from someone with a pathological disturbance immediately. To use that term is a little awkward because... Something about the teeth struck Bromwich. The teeth are nearly human in size, but the front to back dimension of every single tooth has been shortened to accommodate the much smaller jaw. There is no pathology that I'm aware of that so completely and utterly transforms every bit of the skeleton and every single tooth in the mouth. There just isn't one. To Bromwich, it seemed evident that evolution was at work, not disease. Hobbit bones tell the same story. Matt Tocheri's passion is music, and also the study of the hands and feet. Over half of all the bones in, in our skeleton 
are in our hands and feet. And so they tell a big portion of the story of our evolutionary history. Tocheri's specialty is the small bones of the wrist, the carpals, which reveal the changes in primate evolution over millions of years. You can imagine after spending five years of my life looking nothing but these wrist bones from humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, baboons, you name it, plus all the hominid fossils that we have. I mean, after a while, you really start keying in. The human wrist differs dramatically from the wrists of our early ancestors and apes. It basically has a lot to do with a particular bone in the wrist. And that bone is the trapezoid. And that's the wrist bone that sits right underneath your index finger, right here. And it's lodged but between several other wrist bones. And in African apes and other non-human primates, that bone is shaped kind of like a pyramid, triangular shape, where the tip of the pyramid is facing out of the palm. In apes, the forward-facing trapezoid passes force up and down the hand, helpful for hanging from trees or cracking nuts, but difficult for bringing the thumbs and fingers together with precision. But in us, what's happened is we've, the wrist has been redesigned so that we're now more efficient at passing loads across this way. And that makes it easier for humans to grasp objects firmly and use their hands for complex tasks. This is a very big difference compared to all our non-human primate relatives. So this was a great test to look at the wrist bones from Homo floresiensis and see, does it look like humans and Neanderthals or does it look like earlier hominins and African apes? Measurements revealed that the bone was triangular and thus clearly not human. I was more surprised than anyone when I looked at it and realized it's a dead ringer for what we see in earlier hominins and African apes. But the skeptics argued once again that disease could be at work. If you're malnourished or if there is a developmental problem and we know that this person did have some problems, th then you would expect the ankle bones and the wrist bones to be b any shape of bizarre. But to Cherry disagrees. The wrist bones develop very early on during embryological development. Basically by the time you're a 10 week old embryo, you're, these distinctive shapes that I've just described have already formed. So all the genes that express themselves that result in things like hormone disturbances, or they result in things like dwarfism, or they result in things like microcephaly. All, many of those genes don't begin expressing themselves until well after the first trimester of development. Jungers is also convinced. See, this is beautiful, huh? I've measured skeletons of uh, pygmies from Africa, from the Andaman Islands, uh, throughout Southeast Asia, and there's not a single human being on Earth that has the wrists of an Australopithecus or a chimpanzee. The evidence is now pretty persuasive that we're looking at a new species. Science doesn't deal with maybes. It deals with evidence. And we have the evidence in front of us now. Part of it comes from the wrist and Homo floresiensis, the hobbits, as far as we know right now, they're the real deal. Many leading archaeologists and anthropologists now agree that the hobbit 